Hello, welcome to Meet Me at the Movies. I am Noel T. Manning II. Really appreciate you spending time with us right here on C19 TV. And if you're uh, checking us out through the podcast and the radio version through WGWG, we thank you for that as well. My good buddy, Adam Long, man, um, we, we've known each other for, for quite a while, but not long enough is how I always like to, to describe <laughs> that. Uh, you and I um, met a few years ago at a film festival, and we've stayed connected and uh, just always appreciate you and appreciate you having you on the show, man. Oh, same here, same here. I, I uh, It's been over 10 years. Can you believe that? It's I awesome. know. I can't believe it. <laughs> <laughs> we've been uh, we've been doing this sort of thing on and off for over ten years. It's crazy. Uh, yeah, time we re- we, yeah, we really have, and uh, we always have a good time uh, engaging uh, in mm-hmm. dialogue relating to cinema. And uh, today we thought we would kind of talk about summer box office surprises, some things that maybe we didn't really anticipate loving for one reason or another, or maybe it impacted our lives, or maybe it changed us, or. Or, or maybe there's something about it that we go back to. And so uh, so this is summer box office surprises for us. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so uh, that's that's the uh, the theme of today's show right here on Meet Me at the Movies. So, uh, so Adam, I'll let you dive in first, buddy. Tell me, uh, give me, give me one on your list, man. Well, you know, I always have, I'll, I'll give a brief preamble. I first started going to summer movies in the summer of 1977. So I'll date myself. I did see Star Wars in August of that year because in our small town, we didn't get it until August. Uh, so that was, you know, there, there were some, some of the usual suspects like, uh, Star Wars, the following summer, Greece, I saw in a theater, uh, also pretty pivotal. But as far as the surprises, I, I didn't start going to the movies, um, uh, on my own I'm, uh, to a point where, you know, I was unaccompanied by an adult until the summer of 1985. <laughs> yeah. And that was the summer between ninth and 10th grade. My mother started just dropping me off and letting me choose. She felt like I'd reached that age, and uh, one of the first movies that uh, made an impression on me was Tom Holland's Fright Night from 1985. I saw that. uh, It was released. They kind of dumped it. Columbia dumped that at the tail end of August 1985. They had no faith in that movie, Um, and uh, I was a horror guy, horror geek. I read Fangoria magazine regularly back in those days. And I knew about Fright Night. I knew about Tom Holland because he had written Psycho 2 the previous year and The Beast Within the the year before that. So I was aware of who he was. But I think this is the first time out as a director. And I saw it and I was completely blown away. It's, you know, if you it was remade uh, unsuccessfully, if you ask me, in 2011. I mean, Anton Yelkin is fine, but he's no the film itself is just no match for the original. The original is just a, a terrific blend of practical effects and humor and great performances. Chris Sarandon is one of the great, gives you one of the great vampire performances of all time. I was completely blown away, and I loved it so much that I went, and I saw it on a Sunday afternoon, like at a five o'clock show. I loved it so much that I went back the very next week and saw it again on the at the exact same time on the exact same day, Sunday. Uh, that was one of my all-time f- uh, uh, first surprises, I would say, would be uh, Friday yeah. Night from... Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. You know. I, I, yeah, I loved that film, and, and as you said, it was just incredible mixture of finding a way to do horror, but also adding this organic humor that felt realistic within that storyline, and yeah, I, I love that film as well. I'm, I'm with you. The original the original captures it, but uh, not so much for that remake, but man, what a what a great fun film and you're right it was a surprise uh, I'm, I'm i'm really happy that i got a chance to, to check that out as well and still one of my favorites I, I i go back to that um as well well i'm i'm like you um i remember my mom dropping me off uh at the movies to to check out films before i could drive um but um uh, there uh, and, and i love that i absolutely love that she dropped me off and then come back and pick me up or if I wanted to stay and watch another movie, I'd call her on the phone and I'd say, I'm going to watch another one. Come back and pick me up in two more hours. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so there was, a, and it was a pay phone in the lobby. That's, that's what it was. Yep, no cell phones at that time. That's true. <laughs> well, uh, I'm going to go back to 1981. Uh, John Carpenter uh, is someone that we're familiar with and with what he can do. And uh, Escape from New York uh, was one of those films that I really didn't, know a whole lot about uh, i did know kurt russell i mean kurt russell i remember watching him uh in you know these disney rerun classics when he was a disney teen star and uh and he's definitely not uh playing disney in this particular movie 
Uh, Kurt Russell, uh, Ernest Borgnine, Donald Pleasant also in this. Uh, it's a post-apocalyptic sci-fi flick about a president taken hostage. You've also got the island of Manhattan that's turned into this supermax prison. Uh, and a, a guy named Snake, Snake Pliston, and I love the name. He had an eye patch, played by Kurt mm-hmm. Russell. A formal, you know, he was this special forces soldier who turned criminal, and uh, it was up to him to kind of save the day. For me, what I loved about uh, Escape from New York is it launched this different type of sci-fi popcorn flick for me in the early 80s. It was more of, of an adult sci-fi film. It wasn't uh, it, it wasn't kind of that, that handy sci-fi film. There was something different about it. It had engaging characters, uh, and I think it really did, in many ways, ignite my love for a different type of science fiction film. I totally agree. That's a, that's a good choice. Uh, some great character actors in that film, too, are, like you said, are Ernest, Ernest Borgnine, of course, uh, yeah. Donald Pleasance, and uh, Lee Van Cleef. Yes. Uh, and, you know, it was actually <laughs> the second teaming of Carpenter with uh, Kurt Russell. They had uh, previously worked on the Elvis biopic in 1979. So uh, it was kind of people tend to forget that they had worked previously before that. So it's just kind of an interesting trivia. But that's a great choice. Great choice. Yep. yep. All right, man. Well, what, what else is on your list, Adam Long? Okay, so another one from 1985 would be uh, came out the same month uh, as Fright Night, Return of the Living Dead. Uh, which was oh, um, yeah. a yeah a parody of uh, the uh, you know Night of the Living Dead uh, the Dawn of the Dead Day of the Dead had been released earlier in that year and uh, this was um, speaking of Carpenter this was his um, former um, uh, um, I'm trying to think of the screenwriter's name but he was the guy that that co-wrote uh, Dark Star with John Carpenter on their student it was a student film they made it into a feature film and uh, gosh the guy's name is is escaping me. Um, uh, Dan O'Bannon. That's, that's all right. Him, that's Dan all right. Uh, and so uh, Dan O'Bannon would eventually go on to co-write Alien, uh, but he was the uh, the writer director of this film, and it's it's a great send up of uh, zombie films. Uh, it's full of great humor. It gets better with each viewing, um, and it was uh, it earned its R rating in in stripes. Uh, there's nudity there and violence, <laughs> but but a lot of <laughs> a lot of humor too. And uh, it's, uh, it, it was quite the surprise. I didn't see that one twice, but I heartily enjoyed it when I saw it the same <laughs> month as Fright Night. So uh, that was another yeah. summer surprise. Didn't expect that one to be as entertaining as it was. Yeah, and I think, I think you nailed it is the expectations were just a, a, maybe a typical zombie flick kind of thing yeah, exactly. for most people. But it, it, it completely changed that narrative and... Once that happened, I think it opened the door for a lot of others to try to do the same kind of things. I mean, you think now about yep. how many parody or, or, or tongue-in-cheek horror films that we've seen over the years that play the comedy and they, they play it, you know, to the extreme uh, at times. And mm-hmm. I, you know, I don't know that we would have seen, you know, Zombie Land uh, had it not been for a film like this that had, that had come before it and, and you know, really planted the zombie seed, so to speak. <laughs> yeah, right. Good point. Well, uh, you are going in a chronological order with your films as we uh, think about uh, summer films that surprised us uh, in, in one way or another. I'm going to uh, I'm gonna fast forward to uh, a, a film back from the summer of 2011. Uh, for me, I grew up loving the Planet of the Apes franchise, the original. I loved it. I loved the TV series. I loved the lunchboxes, the action figures. Uh, so when I heard that they were bringing the apes back to the screen again after Tim Burton tried and failed with the relaunch back in 2001, my expectations were actually kind of low. Um, but when I went in and what I saw with this new trilogy, uh, with Andy Cir- Circus's magic uh, behind that motion capture, uh, Rise of the Planet of the Apes from 2011, uh, it's a version that really uh, helped me to see a, a classic all over again. It, it made it fresh. Uh, and this uh, entirely new franchise, it became a very fluid trilogy and uh, absolutely loved uh, what we saw with Rise of the Planet of the Apes from the summer of 2011, something that I had not expected to be as good uh, as it was and to launch uh, just a, one of my favorite trilogies. I totally agree. That uh, That is good. I, in fact, I think um, of the three, I think that's still my favorite. Uh, the others were good. 
but I think that first one was a was a nice uh, way to to reboot and relaunch everything. Uh, it's um, it's quite quite the entertaining film. I would totally All agree. Right. Uh, moving along, uh, and I'll briefly uh, mention uh, Psycho 3 the following summer, 1986. Um, I was big on Psycho 2, and um, that uh, Anthony Perkins, actually, who played Norman Bates, directed this one. It didn't do very well at all, uh, but I saw it opening day. I remember it opened on the Wednesday before the 4th of July and saw it uh, and was uh, quite taken with some of uh, Anthony Perkins' directorial choices uh, in the film, and he also uh, had the the... Uh, the foresight to uh, their intelligence or whatever you want to say uh, to use a Carter Burwell who did the score for uh, the Coen brothers blood simple. Uh, he used him to do his, uh, he came in and did the scoring for the film and it has uh, some really, uh, I think some of the humor uh, would, it's not as good as the original psycho, but it's in that, that as far as the dark humor uh, that oh, yeah. he's definitely going for the Hitchcock vibe with some of that stuff. So uh, not a perfect film, but a, definitely a pleasant surprise. So, so uh, what year was that? That was 1986, the following yeah, summer. Yeah, um, uh, when, um, when I, I remember when uh, Psycho 2 and 3 both came out, and mm-hmm. uh, I was connected to a movie theater, and they actually had a cardboard stand-up of Norman Bates, and they allowed me to take it home after the movie had run its course. And so uh, this cardboard stand-up of Norman Bates was in the passenger seat of my car for a number of years when I was in college. And uh, I remember getting uh, quite a few <laughs> uh, second and third looks at, at that. And my, and my son, Thomas, uh, is kind of taking a page out of the, the, the Noel T. Handbook, and he's got a, a cardboard stand-up of Nicolas Cage for his car uh, and, and uh, Daniel Craig and, and a few others. So he rides around with that, so that way he's always got company. So uh, you go. that that's too funny because I remember that standee. It had Norman Bates and he had a set of the keys to the yes, hotel in his hand exactly. like that. And he's like, <laughs> exactly, exactly. I remember it. Well, so, yep. well uh, I will, uh, I will dive in quickly and then we're going to take a break right here. on meet me at the movies. We're talking about uh, films that surprised us, summer films that surprised us in one way or another. And I'm going to mm-hmm. go back to, to the 1980s as well, 1983. Uh, Matthew Broderick, Ali Sheedy, and uh, Dabney Coleman starred in a film called War Games. And uh, it was a film that I really think um, in many ways was kind of ahead of its time, Adam, directed by John mm-hmm. Badham. Um, but you think about a computer hacker, and you know, you think about computer hacker-related films now, they're all over the place. Talk about things relating to video games and people in their basements. That stuff is happening all the time now. But in 83, that was not something that a lot of people talked about. But here we are, War Games from 1983. You've got a computer hacker. You've got video games. And then you you have something that happens that puts America on the brink of a nuclear war with the Soviets. Uh, This film uh, surprised me so much in a lot of different ways. Uh, It connected with me. You know, I was a, 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 a teenager at the time. And... Um, I did love computers, and of course, they're not like what they what they are now. But there was also something going on in the country and the world, and the Cold War was very much alive in the '80s. And uh, this film had a way of, of speaking to that, but doing it through the eyes of teenagers, which I think is why it connected with me so much. And it, it really did surprise me how much I loved this movie. And then it did, of course, go on to be quite successful. Yes, it. it... Quite did, yeah, and it's amazing to think that uh, Badham actually uh, had a movie that was released two months before that, Blue Thunder. So yes, two, yeah, it's amazing that he had both of those movies were huge that summer. Uh, that guy was busy. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Well, uh, you are uh, watching uh, Meet Me at the Movies right here on C nineteen TV and the WG WG as well. I'm joined by Adam Long. A uh, longtime friend and a longtime film fan and film journalist, film critic. Uh, we are talking movies and we're talking about box office surprises for the summer. Uh, hang around after this quick intermission. We're going to come back and talk more movies from the summers that surprised us. Won't you come and meet me at the movies? Won't you come and watch it? Let's all go to the lobby. Let's all go to the lobby. Let's all go to the lobby to get ourselves a seat. Delicious things to eat. 
The popcorn can't be beat. The sparkling drinks are just <laughs> The chocolate bars and the candy. So let's all go to the lobby to get ourselves a treat. Let's all go to the lobby to get ourselves a treat. Won't you come and meet me at the movies? Won't you come and watch it? Welcome back to Meet Me at the Movies. Noel T. Manning II here. I hope everyone is well. Welcome back, Adam Long, as well as we're talking... Summer movies that surprised us over the years. So, wow, Adam, uh, let's let's dive back in, man. And uh, what else is on your list, buddy? <laughs> well, uh, this is another one. Uh, I, I guess I was uh, there's a theme here. I saw a lot of horror films. Uh, <laughs> see, all these are of the horror genre, which I guess I was a horror uh, horror film kid back then. Uh, yeah, in the uh, fall of ni- uh, the late summer of 1988, another um, it was uh, late August, kind of like Fright Night. They uh, dumped this film, and again, Columbia Pictures dumped this one. I think it was TriStar actually dumped this one in theaters. And I went to the theater with a friend of mine, and it, we, we were literally the only people there. Uh, it was on a <laughs> Wednesday night. We were the only two people in the theater, and it was Chuck Russell's The Blob from 1988. <laughs> And we loved it. We had just a great, we had a blast. It was so much fun. Uh, just, just, we just, we loved it. We loved it. it the special effects were amazing. It was another of these trends, uh, kind of like The Thing and The Fly, where they're reinventing these 50s sci-fi horror yeah. films for the 80s. And they, I think that's the great uh, trio right there is The Fly and The Thing and The Blob. Those are three oh, yeah. great reimaginings of 50 horror films that totally work on all levels. And uh, I was one of the few people who actually saw The Blob in theaters. Now it's gotten a reappraisal. A lot of people are, you know, uh, there was a special edition from Screen Factory a couple of years ago. And so, you know, people know it now, but uh, not at the time. I was one of the few, so yeah, <laughs> there you yeah, go. That, that is a good one. I'm glad that you threw in The Thing as well because uh-huh. uh, Kurt, Kurt Russell, again, um, yep. in, in a film, and yeah, the, the thing was, um, that version from, from the 80s was quite amazing, mm-hmm. uh, and you know, they, they used uh, practical effects, of course, but wow, yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that along with the blob, so yeah, that's that's definitely, definitely a good one. Well, I'm going to bring yep. uh, something on my list from uh, 1992, uh, and i got to tell you, I was never a Nicolas Cage fan until 1992. Uh, I'd seen him in films, and he just he didn't click with me. It just, just, there was just something about him I just actually didn't like. But in 1992, uh, he starred in a romantic comedy uh, called Honeymoon in Vegas. James Caan in this, uh, Sarah Jessica Parker as well. Uh, and I loved the aspect of uh, all this happening against the backdrop uh, of Las Vegas and, uh, and Elvis impersonators everywhere. And the soundtrack... <laughs> I still love this soundtrack because there were so many great Elvis covers uh, on this soundtrack. And you get the craziness of, of Nick Cage uh, in this kind of self-induced love triangle of his own making. And uh, Honeymoon, in, Honeymoon in Vegas uh, made me a Nick Cage fan. And I've kind of followed him ever, ever since. And there have been hits and misses, but there's still still find myself uh, following Cage. And I probably never would have done it uh, had it not been the surprise success for me. Uh, for Honeymoon in Vegas, uh, a film that, that just made me laugh and made me sing at the same time. I thought you were going to say uh, Vampire's Kiss, where he had the encounter <laughs> with the cockroach. But it... <laughs> I think he eats one on camera or something. Yeah, in that movie. Exactly. <laughs> no, I kid, I kid. Uh, All right, what else on your list, buddy? Uh, okay. Yeah, uh, let's see. Um, so I'll just uh, plow through. Well, one other 80s title that i, I got to mention, and this is another one that was a box office loser at the time but now has a cult following. Uh, huge fan of Weird Al I was all through the 80s. Uh, big, big fan. So when I heard Weird Al was doing a theatrical film, I thought, oh, I'm there opening day, and everybody <laughs> else will be too. Well, turns out they weren't. Uh, but I was. <laughs> And uh, I laughed and laughed and laughed. I was not disappointed. Uh, my kind of humor and just, I thought it was hysterical. I, I split my sides laughing all through the movie. So many great gags. I just walked out with the best feeling. A uh, UHF, which was Weird Al's, you know, one and only feature film. Yeah. yeah. And it was such a huge commercial disappointment that he literally uh, just kind of retreated for two years. 
Um, or maybe it was, I think it was three years because he didn't come around until 1992 when he did the, uh, the Smells Like Nirvana. He came back, but he basically buried his head in the sand for a couple of years and licked his wounds uh, because he was very upset by the failure of yeah. the film. And it's, uh, I don't know. I, I don't understand it. Now it's a cult favorite and it right. sells you know, well on home video and a lot of people are familiar with it. But, uh, uh, again, a couple of buddies and I, we saw it and opening week. Um, yeah, I think it was opening weekend and we just loved it. Love, love, loved it. So, uh, UHF, yeah, I, Weird Al, 1989. Yeah, I, I was a, a fan of Weird Al as well. And, and I remember, remember that movie and actually, uh, there was a, a last of the Mohicans reunion and, uh, I, I'm, I'm, there's a purpose for me saying that. But I pulled out some old photos uh, and looking back at those pictures from when I worked on Last Mohicans. And in one of those pictures, I'm wearing the T-shirt UHF with with it's the, the movie poster <laughs> <laughs> with Al, Weird Al on it. And I was and so when you said that, I'm like, yep, I had that T-shirt. Yep. <laughs> that T-shirt. Oh, yeah. I had the soundtrack <laughs> album and everything. I was big, big fan, big fan. Awesome. Well, man, I'm going to uh, let's see where I'm going to go now. I think I'm going to go to the year 1989. Uh, on movies that uh, connected with me and surprised me for one reason or another. Uh, This movie is called The Abyss. Uh, There were some really high expectations early on when a guy named James Cameron started talking about doing this film, shooting it uh, at Earl Owensby Studios in Gaffney, South Carolina, at an abandoned nuclear power plant that had never been complete. Uh, And, and, you know, there was this buzz about Cameron going to create this you know, special effects, alien underwater picture that was like nothing we'd ever seen before. But when all the production cost, weather delays, and the Cameron chaos kind of took over, uh, 20th Century Fox, you know, rushed this into the theaters. They took over the final editing because of extended runtime. They wanted to make sure they got it in the summer. So the expectations for this film at that point kind of crumbled like a giant Jenga set. But when I got a chance to see it, I was blown away by the scope of the picture visually. And what I mean by that, the technical aspects of filmmaking, that's what really surprised me because I was kind of going in expecting something a lot less because of all the problems within the production. But man, I was blown away by the technical achievements from the sound design to the cinematography to the the groundbreaking visual effects and those underwater shots where you were induced into this kind of water claustrophobia man I, I was just really impressed by that and while the theatrical release definitely had its issues and i think mostly because of editing choices the film was designed for the big screen and for big sound and it did not disappoint it actually exceeded my expectations because of that and also knowing that this film was shot in my backyard. Uh, it was kind of a joyful surprise for me. So The Abyss uh, from 1989 is uh, on my list as surprises. And if you've never seen the director's cut of that, I highly recommend it. Well worth your time. And then if you really want to explore, take a look at the making of The Abyss, the documentary, because that is completely amazing and fascinating that the movie ever got made. Yeah, so do you prefer the uh, director's version or the uh, the original theatrical? I'm just I, I, I like the director's cut. Yeah, I like the director's cut. I do too. It's the whole subplot that turns the uh, entire uh, meaning of the film in a different direction. So uh, we yeah. got time for uh, we got time for at least one more. So let's uh, see what is on your list, buddy. All right. So let's just I'm just going to plow through a couple of '90s ones and then we'll end up in the 2010s. We'll say that uh, several '90s ones. Gremlins 2. I want to mention that. What a t- delightful sequel. Uh, even better than the original film, in my opinion. And then we have um, Unlawful Entry from 1992. Yeah. Uh, that was a good uh, thriller with Ray Liotta. Uh, when a man loves a woman, a great. Uh, and these are the kind of movies that Disney used to make, if you can imagine. Uh, Disney <laughs> making a movie like about alcoholism, a heavy drama yeah, about alcoholism right. aimed at adults. But yeah. this was a time when they did. Um, just goes to show you how the business has changed, and sometimes not for the better. Um, so I married an axe murderer, uh, which was the, <laughs> the film that uh, that Mike Myers made in between the Wayne's World films, and is quite funny, I think. And then the one that I'll end up with is from 2012. This was a pleasant surprise to me. It was the Steve Carroll, uh, Kieran Knightley film, Seeking a Friend for the End of the World, which has become one of my favorite films of the last 10 years. Um, 
beautiful, beautiful film. Um, and the title pretty much tells you, um, you know, what's going on there. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. uh, the world is uh, getting ready to get wiped out by a, a meteor. And so, um, you know, Steve Carroll decides to go and try to reconnect with his first love. And uh, he takes his uh, neighbor with him uh, so she can, you know, and, and they try to flee for the countryside or whatever to, so he can do his thing. And anyway, they fall in love on the way. And it's just a beautiful, beautiful film. Yeah. With great uh, use of um, records as part of the uh it's in, integral to the plot, I guess you would say, vinyl and the love of vinyl and just great needle drops in that film. Yeah. Um, just excellent use of uh, the air that I breathe by air, uh, um, uh, the Hollies, the Hollies. Yes, okay, yes. Uh, so anyway, don't want to say, uh, you know, I don't, don't want to belabor uh, the point too much. But anyway, Seeking a Friend for the End of the World is a beautiful yeah. film that literally played two weeks and disappeared. And I yeah. was one of the people who saw it in the theater. So, <laughs> yeah. so there we go. Awesome, awesome. Well, I will. Uh, I'll wrap up with just a, a handful as well, less than a handful. Babe from 1995, just a sweet film. A talking pig, a singing farmer, and a movie that almost had more heart than any other film released in '95. It was a sleeper for Universal, and it took James Cromwell to awards recognition. I remember interviewing James Cromwell the following year, and he mentioned that this was the project that that changed his life it changed him from the standpoint of giving getting opportunities he'd been in the industry for a long time but babe made the biggest impact uh, on his life and uh, i'm going to go back a few years for something that's not family friendly phantasm from 1979 low budget sci-fi horror film you and i've talked about some horror films on this show today you know it was complete with surrealism it had freaky characters a, a, a really strange undertaker and some zombie-like chaos happening. Uh, one of the early horror films that I felt, uh, for me, it challenged the genre. It was uh, directed, written, produced, uh, and cinematography and editing by a guy, guy named Don, um, what is that, Cos- Coscarelli? Coscarelli. Yeah. yeah, he did it all. And uh, that's a cult classic and, uh, and one that I highly recommend going back to, yeah. and it spawned some sequels. Um, yeah, as and, well, uh, and he followed it up with the uh, the big uh, HBO staple Beastmaster. So, a couple yes. of years later, <laughs> <laughs> that's right, that's right. Well, uh, really appreciate everybody spending time with us right here on Meet Me at the Movies. We've been talking about uh, movies of the summer, summer's past that surprised us in one way or another. Uh, Adam Long, our guest here, a longtime friend and longtime movie lover. So, Adam, where's the best pe- place that people can find you and your work? Uh, you can just go to uh, focusnewspaper.com. I publish a uh, weekly roundup of Blu-ray, 4K releases, and theatrical and streaming things that I think might be of interest to people. And uh, you can that's published every Thursday. And then moviegeeksunited.com, uh, where I do a Blu-ray roundup once a month. And occasionally I'll interview uh, guests. Uh, yeah. Awesome. Adam, thanks for joining us as always. Uh, good to see you, man. Uh, good to talk about movies. We appreciate everybody tuning in uh, right here on Meet Me at the Boobies, C19 TV and WGWG. Uh, and until next time, I'm Noel T. Manning II for the cast and crew right here. That's a wrap. Many films to view until we meet again. Next time we see you, we'll gladly fill you in. We'll tell about the happy and the sad ones We'll talk about the good ones and the bad ones Many films to view Till we meet again